is so good to be with you. I know that I'm from this stake as well, that I represent uh, our mission presidency, and President and Sister Pinnock love you. We talk about you often in our meetings and how much impact you have both on the missionaries that serve here, the support that you give them, and our friends that are just coming by the boatload into the church. We live in the last days. These are the days prophesied of in ancient scripture. When writing to the saints, which were at Ephesus, the apostle Paul prophesied that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, God might gather together in one all things in Christ. Accompanying this marvelous dispensation of which Paul spoke comes a tremendous responsibility. And ye are called to bring to pass the gathering of mine elect. For mine elect hear my voice and harden not their hearts. Just two years ago, President Nelson clearly reminded us of this call when he said, we have the sacred responsibility to share the power and peace of Jesus Christ with all who will listen and who will let God prevail in their lives. Every person who has made covenants with God has promised to care about others and serve those in need. We can demonstrate faith in God and always be ready to respond to those who ask about the hope that is in us. Each of us has a role to play in the gathering of Israel. Within the Doctrine and Covenants, as the instruction that God gave us for the building of his kingdom in the latter days, there is found a remarkable amount of promises that God has offered to those who accept his call to share the gospel. Who of you wouldn't benefit from increased power and strength, personal purity and faith, happiness, health, prosperity, and being filled with the Holy Ghost? And so that you know, I'm not just making all this up because I wear this mission tag, and part of my job is to encourage you to be member missionaries. Let me just read a small selection from various sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. For those of you who would like extra power and strength in their life, we find the following. You shall receive strength such as not known among men. He himself will go with you and be in your midst. Nothing shall prevail against you. Your tongue shall be loosed, and you will have the power of God unto the convincing of men. Your arm will be God's arm. How about personal purity and increased faith? You shall stand blameless before God. You will be given a testimony of the words of the prophets. You shall have revelations. Your sins will be forgiven. If you're seeking happiness, health, and prosperity, you shall have blessings greater than the treasures of earth. He will take care of your flocks. You shall not be weary in mind, body, limb, or joint, and you shall not go hungry or thirsty. A hair from your head shall not fall to the ground unnoticed. Your joy shall be great. Desiring to be filled with the Holy Ghost, he will send upon you the Comforter, which shall teach you the truth and the way whither you shall go. His Spirit shall be in your hearts, and his angels round about you. He will make you holy. After that inspiring list of promises, I hope that the missionary fire is stirring within you and you desire to claim those blessings. Who wouldn't feel that way after hearing what marvelous promises God has? A natural question that many then ask is, how do I get started? There are four practices you can begin today to help you claim the blessings that are promised to those who hear the beckoning voice of the Lord. These four practices are to, one, call yourself on a mission. Two, set a goal to invite others to learn about the restored gospel. Three, prepare simple responses and invitations. And four, go about doing good. Practice one, call yourself on a mission. And while I'm with Sister Edmeyer here, and I definitely encourage those who are at the stage of their life to fill, uh, serve full-time missions or service missions, uh, submit your missionary applications, get out there. But I'm also talking to you right now as member missionaries. 
How do you call yourself on a mission? Are, are you even allowed to call yourself on a mission? Well, yes. According to the Doctrine and Covenants, section 4 and verse 3, if ye have desires to serve God, ye are called to the work. And what does it take to be qualified? Verse 5 in the same section articulates that faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God qualify you for the work. Hence, under the license given to each of us in section 4 of the Doctrine and Covenants, call yourself on a mission and strive for those qualifying qualities. Practice 2. Set a goal and a deadline to have someone ready to be taught the gospel. Many important things in our lives have deadlines. Our mortgage, gas, phone, water, and electric companies, as well as the internal revenue <coughs> services and uh, election processes, they all impose deadlines to be sure that we pay our bills, file taxes, submit our voter ballots. If we didn't, we probably would keep forgetting to pay or file or vote. Goals and deadlines, in other words, help almost all of us to do important things we need to do. During a general conference address, Elder M. Russell Ballard suggested a simple way in which each one of us can exercise our faith and start our personal missionary service. Write down a date in the near future on which you will have someone ready to be taught the gospel. He continues, you will notice that I did not suggest that you write down a name, but rather that you write down a specific date. The key to our success will be to ask for divine guidance that we might be directed to those who will accept the gospel. Because living the gospel is essential to the remission of sins, and because giving missionary service is essential to, to living the gospel, I believe each one of us must set a definite date at least once a year to have an individual or a family ready to be taught the gospel. When we engage in a covenant with God that we will do something that one of our leaders has asked us to do, and we are desperate to do what we have committed to do, God truly comes to trust us, and he will provide a way for us to be successful. Practice number three, prepare a few simple responses and invitations for when opportunities do arise. This might start with using words and sharing experiences with friends and colleagues that open the door for people to identify you as a follower or disciple of Jesus Christ and a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. While serving in our ward mission in Seattle, a ward mission plan we created called this Being Honest About Our Faith in Jesus Christ. President Nelson and other many, many other church leaders have often referred to this as sharing the gospel in normal and natural ways. As that door opens through your day-to-day -day conversations, you'll find that your friends occasionally will walk through that door by asking, oh, so you're a Mormon? You can respond, you're, uh, you can prepare yourself with a simple and effective response. That might sound something like this. I am, and it is a wonderful church. Why do you ask? Rather than telling uh, them information that they don't care about, I find it very helpful to ask, why do you ask? This way we can have a conversation about what they're interested in. Most of the time, their interest is casual, and that's just fine. But on occasion, the person will show even more interest, which then gives me the, the chance to invite them to have a deeper conversation. <laughs> to respond well to a question is good and important. However, it seems harder for most to live the commission extended in Doctrine and Covenants 2816, to open your mouth at all times, declaring Christ's gospel with the sound of rejoicing. I often hear the reason it is more difficult to do this with people we know well is because people fear damaging relationships with their friends and colleagues. In his book, The Power of Everyday Missionaries, Elder Clayton Christensen shared a practice he called decoupling, which he found helpful to overcome this natural challenge. He writes, I decouple my invitation to learn about the church from my relationship with my friend by using language like this. Scott, I'm going to ask you a question, but before I ask, we need to agree that our friendship won't be affected if you decide this isn't of interest to you, okay? Almost always they assure me that this is alright. Then I say, as you know, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. For a while I've just had the sense that there are a few aspects about the church that might be interesting to you. 
If at some point you have an interest, I'd love a chance to talk a bit more about these things. By couching my invitation this way, I make it easy for them to say no. And as a consequence, it doesn't strain my relationship with them at all. In fact, whether or not they have an interest, almost always they will thank me for caring enough about them to ask. My own personal experiences validate these practices. As I've thought about and practiced my responses and invitations, the way I've spoken with friends, colleagues, neighbors, and even strangers has opened the door for me to have many gospel conversations. Many have expressed genuine appreciation for my thoughtfulness. Some have declined initial invitations, but encouraged me to continue inviting them to future church functions. And a few have even accepted my invitation to join us at sacrament meetings and other church-related events. Practice number four, go about doing good. The 13th article of faith begins with the statement, we believe in being honest, true, chaste, benevolent, virtuous, and in doing good to all men. One example of this practice and its indelible impact can be found in the experience of two recently baptized members within this stage. It is with their permission that I share their story. Angie had been raised in a devoutly religious family outside of our faith. And like many young adults, she went through a period of time where her behaviors weren't aligned with her family's religious practices. Because her father was in a, a position of local leadership, she was disfellowshipped from their congregation, and her own family was required to ostracize her when outside of the home. Later in life, Angie began to date Richard, a convert of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, whose membership had recently been withdrawn. While they both had lost their church membership, their ensuing experiences with their respective churches couldn't have been more different. After Richard's membership withdrawal, his ward members continued to minister to him. Angie was shocked when a local leader of Richard's ward invited them to his home for a dinner. This sort of, dis uh, this sort of fellowshipping would not have been allowed in Angie's religious experience. It led her to question what sort of church would have a people who remain so open and loving to those who have formal restrictions or withdrawal of their membership. In due time, Angie's curious observations turned into a genuine interest to learn more about the doctrine of such a church. The missionaries and members within their ward boundaries were invited to Angie and Richard's home to share with them the message of the restoration, answer Angie's questions, and help her make and keep commitments to live the gospel. Through their study and prayer, Angie gained a witness that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the Lord's true and living church, and Richard determined to be readmitted by baptism. They were both baptized on the same day. In this very building, in our baptismal font, theirs is one of many remarkable stories that demonstrate the power of members who go about doing good to all men. I invite you to follow the admonition of the Apostle Peter to the early members of the church to keep your conversation honest among the Gentiles that they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God. As you implement these four practices, you might find that not everyone will jump immediately into the waters of baptism or even accept your invitation to learn more about the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Does this mean that you have failed when someone declines your sincere invitation? Not at all. Most of us fear failure. Once we have realized that we succeed as member missionaries when we invite people to learn and accept the truth, much of the fear that kept us from sharing the gospel vanishes. We give them the opportunity to exercise their agency. Some will use that agency to accept the gospel. Others will not, and that's fine. We succeed when we invite. Our inspired and inspiring prophet, President Nelson, declared unequivocally, the Lord is hastening his work to gather Israel. This is the most important thing taking place on the earth today. Nothing else compares in magnitude, nothing else compares in importance, nothing else 
there's a majesty. And if you choose to, if you want to, you can be a big part of it. I testify that God lives. This is his work and glory. Increasing your participation in God's work of salvation and exaltation will bring greater joy into your life. You will claim the promised blessings of the strength of God, faith in Jesus Christ, a forgiveness of your sins, and you will be filled with the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.